Hello, everyone. Great to be here with you. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Steve Waldman. I'm the co-founder and president of Report for America. And um, we have a really interesting panel with Dr. Paulette Brown Hines and Dave Mengebeer. Uh, and I'm just going to say a, a couple words and then we're going to dive right into the conversation with these two uh, leaders in this field. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Report for America, we're a national service program that places uh, talented local journalists into local newsrooms around the country. We have 300 reporters in the field uh, right now uh, reporting on undercover communities and topics. About 200 newsrooms roughly split between uh, equally between for-profit and nonprofit newsrooms. Two things you might not know about Report for America. One is that the very first money and support for Report for America came from the Lenfest Institute. Um, so they were there from the very, very beginning and has been a great partner uh, with us uh, ever since. And the second thing is that uh, a equally important mission for Report for America in addition to getting reporters in the field is to work with newsrooms to make them more sustainable, uh, to make these not only our positions permanent, hopefully, or enduring, but to help those newsrooms themselves to, uh, to create more diversified and healthier revenue streams. We sometimes refer to philanthropy as the third revenue stream uh, both because we want people to think of it as a revenue stream uh, and also to acknowledge that it's uh, not the only revenue stream. Uh, we, uh, the, the team uh, that we have a couple, we call a sustainability team, uh, Amy Bond, who's on, on the call and Todd Franco, our director of local sustainability, who you, you may know are here. And they um, and Jimmy Martinez worked with newsrooms around the country to help them in a variety of different ways. And uh, you know, we have seen this field, the, the local philanthropy to local news organizations, really grow in the last few years. Just among our programs, the the amount raised from our local newsrooms has gone from eight hundred sixty thousand up to more than five million uh, in in the last couple of years. So it's exciting to see that just the that the local philanthropy is is uh, really starting to get traction. Our focus today is on a a trend that uh, our team noticed, I think, starting about a year ago, uh, and we're going to be putting out a more detailed report on it uh, very soon. And it's, it's around what we are calling community news funds. It's a really interesting kind of incipient trend, which is basically community foundations and news organizations or some combination of things getting together and creating a fund that is taking in uh, support from the community as a whole and supporting the local journalism ecosystem. This, as opposed to, you know, just a grant from one community foundation to a newspaper. This really seems like an important trend to us because it has the potential to engage the community more broadly and bring in more money and be more enduring. Have it really be a kind of permanent or lasting contribution to the local news ecosystems. So even though it's kind of early, uh, we thought it was really important to kind of dive into what does this look like? What are its different forms? You know, what's working, what's not working? I mean, our estimate based on the, the, the seven uh, examples that we've focused on so far is that the seven examples alone uh, have already raised in the last few years more than eight million dollars, and we expect that that to go over ten million uh, from just seven local news fund uh, community news fund examples. So it's just you know 
anecdotal at this point. It's a small, small subset, but pretty encouraging. So uh, we, we wanted to bring together two leaders in this area, uh, leaders in general in local journalism and philanthropy, but who also has some experience with this new twist uh, that, we're, that we're starting to see and just kind of dive into exploring this and some other issues related to local, uh, to local philanthropy. And I'm just gonna start off with a couple questions, you know, each for, for um, David and Paulette, and then we'll mix it up a little bit more. I mean, these, are, these are both people who have um, really been leaders uh, in this field of, you know, in, activating uh, local philanthropy to help local journalism. So why don't I start with, uh, with Dave, uh, who is the, um, the CEO of the Grand Traverse City Regional Community Foundation in Michigan. Uh, we um, have a Report for America uh, person there and um, they have done some really interesting things in this area. Why don't we just start a little bit with Dave? Why don't you describe, if you could, what the collaboration that you have going now between the Community Foundation and newsrooms, when did that start? What was sort of the impetus for that? Yeah, so first of all, I'm, I'm happy to be here and participating in this conversation. And uh, just a little bit of clarification. So the name of the foundation is the Grand Traverse Regional Community Foundation at, uh, and Traverse City is uh, in Grand Traverse County. And our foundation, because we have a lower population density, we serve um, five counties in Northwest Lower Michigan. So the way this all started was uh, probably more than a year ago, um, the publisher of the Traverse City Record Eagle, which is our regional newspaper, his name's Paul Heidbretter, and Nate Payne, their chief edit editor, um, approached the Community Foundation about this concept of partnering uh, uh, with them to um, support, um, really come up with a new business model that creates a new revenue stream for, for the newsroom. And I think the people on this call um, probably are aware um, that the business model for uh, local uh, newspapers turned just completely upside down and where they used to get 70 to 80% of their revenue from advertising, uh, that uh, now represents only about maybe 20 to 30% of their, the revenue they need to support their operation. So obviously uh, something needs to change uh, in order to sustain uh, local newsrooms. And here in Michigan, uh, we have seen many of the local newspapers basically hollowed out. So uh, most of the newsroom staff laid off, you know, the newspapers themselves simply re re regurgitating, uh, you know, verbatim news releases or um, uh, AP stories. And so um, when we sat down with Paul and Nate, I have to say the first thing that happened is you know, most people, myself included, really weren't aware of uh, the business model. Obviously, recognize the critical importance of uh, local journalism to our region, uh, but we really needed to kind of first go through this learning curve and understand what has changed, and um, and understand that there is this opportunity to partner with um, our local newspaper. Fortunately, in our case. Um, we had a member of the community with a long history in the newspaper business. He owned multiple newspapers in his career, which he then sold uh, back around 2008. And he's also a major supporter and donor of the Community Foundation. So he's been a fantastic resource in sort of bridging uh, between uh, uh, the editor and, um, and, and the uh, publisher who I, I, I think they would even admit don't really know anything about development and fundraising and the community foundation. So that's how we uh, kind of got started. Uh, for my own part, um, I just recognize that um, our local newspaper is a foundational institution for our region, just like our libraries, our community colleges, 
our community centers, and I've been jokingly saying our microbreweries, because I think uh, these are all sort of essential um, elements of a healthy, vibrant, uh, thriving community. And so for me, um, I think it's really important. And I would say, just I'll just stop here, say, I think really the key, if I had to put my finger on one thing about how these partnerships emerge, it's leadership. You have to have the leadership of both uh, the, the newspaper and uh, the community foundation, whoever the leading philanthropic organizations are in the region, and they have to agree this is vitally important for the uh, areas that they serve. But just to, to, to uh, follow up on one thing you said, the idea that the newspaper is a foundational institution. Uh, how do you explain that to people who might not start off with that assumption? Yeah, you know, I was personally influenced by a book that was written by uh, James and Deb Fallows. It's called Our Towns. It has now been made into a documentary. And they flew to small and mid-sized cities all across the United States and discovered how these kind of um, off, the, off the beaten track communities had reinvented themselves, revitalized themselves. And so basically what they found is all of these communities have certain shared characteristics. Uh, and the ones I mentioned, you know, really vibrant libraries. And, and I'm not kidding, they did say microbreweries, but also community centers, other places where uh, people could gather and kind of build community. And I think <clears throat> having a strong, vibrant local newspaper is an obvious component of that. So that's, that's what I say uh, when I'm starting to meet with donors. And I wanna just also clarify, this is a kind of a journey of discovery. Um, we have been working on this now for a relatively short period of time. And so we're sort of finding our way in how to best message and inspire prospective donors and funders to support this thing. Because as I said at the beginning, this is sort of a new concept that people have to kind of work through to get their head around. And, uh, and but I have, I have a sense of optimism that uh, this is going to be successful. And honestly, what Stephen said at the very beginning that gotten off to a very strong start, I think is a good uh, indicator of that. Have you gotten any resistance to the idea of supporting a for-profit entity? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's one of, one of the, as a matter of fact, um, one of the um, local family foundations is owned by a radio station. And when I was talking to their board about this, they said, well, we don't see the cavalry riding in and providing funding for our for-profit radio station. Why should we support the newspaper? So that was kind of the beginning of that conversation. So this is an issue that I think everybody that's creating these community new, news funds is going to encounter. And again, I think that the main thing is for them to understand that the business model has basically been turned upside down. And if they want to retain their local newspapers, then something's going to have to change. And that's going to include the community is going to have to come in and be a financial uh, partner for their newspaper if it's going to, to, to be sustained. And, you know, Ace like reminds me of that song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And uh, Todd Franco, who is uh, RFA's, you know, regional director here in the Midwest, you know, he worked for the Sandusky paper. One day they were open, the next day they were closed and several hundred people showed up and said, what happened? And uh, we wanna make sure that doesn't happen with um, our, our local newspaper. And do you have any sense of the, the folks who have contributed so far, do you have any sense of what their motivation is? Yeah, I think they've kind of bought into this. So there's, there's several kind of motivations. You know, what you find when you're doing development and fundraiser is um, donors are different. So they're motivated by different things. So some, I think, buy into this sort of um, idea that uh, we need to maintain these uh, foundational institutions in our community for it to be healthy and resilient and thriving. Some are, uh, you know, obviously um, uh, are avid uh, newspaper readers, either the hard copy or online. And I think some are committed uh, to newspapers being kind of the third rail and making sure that as the community conducts its business, 
that it's done in a transparent way, that the community is informed, and that uh, it has a reporting staff that's producing high quality reporting and journalism. So in our case, with the Traverse City Record Eagle, then RFA's uh, grant, which we're working to, to match, uh, has supported two uh, reporters. One is a reporter that is the first in Michigan to cover issues affecting the indigenous people here, the tribes, their culture, their history, their businesses, uh, their own philanthropy, uh, and a wide range of other issues. And the other is a data reporter. And that has allowed the Record Eagle to do a deep dive into stories like suicides in our jails and also the impact of the pandemic in nursing homes, without which they just could did not have the bandwidth to kind of get into the level of uh, entrepreneurial journalism that uh, they needed to run those kinds of stories. Fantastic. Let me, I would love to turn to Paulette now. Um, and Dr. Brown Tynan says a number of different hats here that are are all relevant actually to this discussion. Uh, is the founder of Voice Media Ventures and the publisher of the Black Voice News, which we are very very proud to say has uh, a report for America core members, um, and is also the current chair of the Inland Empire Community Foundation board of directors. So she has a really interesting perspective from both the, the media side and the philanthropy side and has done, uh, you know, really a, leading a really interesting project there called Media in Color. Uh, why don't we start with that uh, to talk a little bit about what Media in Color is, why, why y'all launched it and how it's doing. Great, thanks, Steve. Yes, and I'll probably reference a couple of other hats I wear too. Um, I'm um, on the board of the James Irvine Foundation, which is a major uh, foundation, private foundation in California. And a, a lot of our work in our priority regions in the throughout the state, a lot of our work is in partnership and collaboration with community foundations. Um, so I'm chair of the board of the Inland Empire Community Foundation. I sit on the board of the James Irvine Foundation, uh, publisher of the Black Voice News, second generation publisher, um, and some of my folks. And my, I see some of my peeps on the call, so I'll be referencing some of them. I saw some names. Um, and I'm, I'm past, uh, past chair of the uh, California News Publishers Association. Um, but started um, Media and Color as an initiative with two colleagues. And it actually started before, a uh, conversation started before the pandemic. Um, Arturo Camona, who works with Latino Media Collaborative, which just recently received its own nonprofit status. And um, he's also a um, uh, uh, contractor with La Pinon, works with La Pinon. And Neil Chase, who is um, CEO for Cal Matters, and I recently was on the Cal Matters board. And we were just talking about um, kind of the, the future of news serving communities of color throughout California. Um, and how do we help um, kind of the digital transformation work that needs to be done in that space? And so this was prior to uh, COVID, right before actually, um, when, um, so that was pre-COVID conversation a few months before when COVID hit, there was kind of this, um, what we saw as an inflection point, kind of this moment of disruption. And we thought, this is, we wanted to look at it as an opportunity. And there were funders in California who were really interested in ensuring that we have a vibrant um, kind of information ecosystem uh, in communities of color. And that uh, group was led by um, the California Healthcare Foundation, actually the, the um, director of communications. And so um, got together with, with several funders, raised a little over a million dollars, about 1.2, I think uh, was the amount and started working with some legacy organizations, our first cohort, seven, um, seven uh, publishers, uh, eight in the second cohort, and um, focused on digital capacity building, audience growth, revenue generation. And then we really wanted to create kind of a, a learning community. So uh, we did workshops and presented, uh, some of us presented to our colleagues. Um, I did a workshop on um, grants and philanthropy because I had a lot of success at doing that and understood that space. Another publisher did events uh, sponsorships. 
Um, we also have a partnership uh, with our work now with the Media and Color with the Center for Community Media. I saw some folks uh, from the Center for Community Media, CUNY, on this uh, call in this in this Zoom room. Uh, and we just launched a creators lab. So now we're looking at where are the gaps? Where are the places where um, communities need um, uh, better, more qu quality information? And so we launched that. I'm actually speaking to that group. Um, I think we have about 15 or 16 um, individuals, um, on new media entrepreneurs, uh, who are really interested in, in providing local news and information in their communities. So I have a session with them later today. Um, and so working closely with the Center for Community Media on that. And then the, the, the last thing, we, we, we're doing some research um, and we have these regional media tables. And that's where there's some connection with community foundations. One of our um, um, foundations that we work with was the California Community Foundation is in LA County. And they help fund some of the work of our, we have regional community, uh, regional media tables and there's an LA media table. They help fund some of that work. They also helped us fund some research um, where we're, we're trying to map the LA media ecosystem. Um, and my team is working on, on that with the funding from the California Community Foundation. Um, and then some research on um, community foundations and media in California. And that was something that really started uh, with one of my other hats, the California, California Press Foundation, just really interested in seeing um, what's happening across California when it comes to community foundations and, and, and um, supporting media, local media. Um, and then what, uh, how can we provide some resource for those that are interested in doing something that aren't currently, including my own community foundation, uh, my CEO is so upset with me that I'm doing this work and we don't really have a fund yet <laughs> at the Inland Empire Community Foundation. Um, so I was able to commission uh, Jane Elizabeth, who I know is on this on the, in the Zoom room with us, and uh, she just finished the first draft of a guidebook. Um, we have partnered with the, the uh, League of California Community Foundations. Um, they um, uh, said, you know, uh, about a third of their members have something they're already doing and about two thirds really want to do something. Um, in this space. And so we just thought this was an opportunity to provide some type of, of direction. And we're really excited about the report that you have coming out soon that Amy has been working on uh, and the team has been working on um, because we know there's interest here um, in supporting that, um, those kind of funds um, in, in development throughout California. You're on mute. <laughs> um bad role modeling as moderator there. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, what, what is the primary, for, so far, what are you finding is the, the type of help that newsrooms most want or value from you? So with the first um, cohort, we were really focused on the tech and just, you know, how do we build a digital newsroom? So, so, so many of us are legacy and I'll just use myself as an example. Um, my, my colleague I've known since we were, were um, teenagers, Larry Lee, he, he texted me today, he, uh, Larry Lee with Sacramento Observer, he can't, couldn't be on the call. I mean, he couldn't be in the Zoom room, but he wanted to wish me luck. He was one of our first members of our cohort. You know, Larry's um, father started that paper, my parents, um, didn't start our newspaper or publishers before I was. And, you know, it's our paper's 50 year old paper. We have been focused on, as David said, um, most of our revenue is print from digital, I mean, a display advertising. And so it's like, how do you move from that to a, really a, a digital organization? And so what we found, at least with this, the first cohort, is like we really needed the consultation. Um, uh, we, we hired our, our Gina Serrano who, who, Serrano, who worked with us weekly on the, you know, moving to a new CMS and then the workflows that we needed to develop. I mean, there's skill sets we needed, but we also needed just simple, like how do we, how do we go from, um, 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 you know, what, what technology do we use to communicate in the newsroom? You know, um, how do we um, focus on building kind of a revenue structure around that? and our infrastructure around that. So that was what we found a lot of 
the publishers really wanted. And they're very interested in um, um, the diversity of funding now as well. So, you know, we talked about sponsorships, memberships, and then grant funding. That was a big interest. And then how can we collaborate? Because I, I was fortunate. I, um, I actually have a, a grant writer on my team and he, he's, he's been, he writes my, my grants. Uh, and most people don't have that. So they're like, how can we collaborate maybe to apply for, you know, larger grants? And then some people went back and just found that there were opportunities within their region. They didn't know were there and they applied for funding and got it. Um, and in terms of the the folks, the, the donors that have supported um, media in color, has that tended to be bigger organizations, or have you have you solicited grassroots smaller donors, or is it more uh, you know community foundations and institutions? You know, it's been um, the large donors because those were our relationships. Um, it was great with California Healthcare Foundation. Eric and TV was just wonderful. Um, he really brought in and kind of coordinated his colleagues at some of the major foundations, uh, made it easy for us even when it came to like reporting out, um, um, kind of making a template for us. So it was just easier um, for us to do, to do the work and not, not spend so much time on, on all of the, the reporting requirements. Um, we haven't tried to solicit smaller donors yet. Um, we are in this phase now, we've been talking with um, Arab, Arabella uh, advisors and we're looking at um, a, a new fiscal sponsorship and they're talking about how they can bring in their um, um, kind of funding community. Um, and we're, we are looking at expanding beyond the, the, the initial group, but the first group, you know, they, they basically um, funded this with between four, four major foundations. And what was what was the their motivation? What was the the pitch that you made uh, for for them to support an effort like this? What's what's what was great is it it wasn't um, they were already doing some funding in the space, especially um, in harder to reach communities, communities of color, and I'll use Irvine, uh, James Irvine Foundation is uh, as an example. Um, we really are focused on helping low wage workers in California advance economically. And we have, um, you know, priority communities that um, receive less philanthropic support, have more, you know, more challenges and are more diverse. And we found great partnerships uh, with um, our local community media and you know, we actually done a, quite a few few things to support um, some of the, um, uh, not just the organizations, but initiatives like Media and Color. Um, this isn't the only thing that um, that Irvine or some of the others support. You know, they support ethnic media services. They they support California Black media. Those kind of advocacy groups and those groups that are working to help the sector, um, and, and and find it. So it wasn't it wasn't a hard sell at all. Okay. Good. Um, I want to, I see we're getting a bunch of questions. So why don't we start opening it up a little bit um, to, uh, to some questions from this very well-informed audience. Uh, Todd, do you uh, yeah, let's have- go, Yeah, let's go right, right in order. Um, Cheryl Thompson Morton, funny you guys mentioned uh, CUNY and the, uh, and the media lab out there that, 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 that Dr. Brown's gonna be part of later. Cheryl's from there and she asks, uh, how do you recommend publishers begin conversations with their community foundations about supporting local news? I, Paulette, do you wanna handle that one? I, I could start and then David, I could start and David could go just, um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting as a, found, as a community foundation that doesn't have a, a fund yet. Um, we have, we have, interested community leaders who want to do something to support um, better journalism in our region. And so for our community foundation, it's, um, it's a conversation that we already want to have. And we wanna, we wanna use it to bring in even for us conversation with, with donors that may not be donors currently to the community foundation. Um, and so we have our like our, our, our regional roundtable, and so we're already talking with them um, about how we can 
partner with the community foundation, there was an interest in starting a uh, community news fund. Um, the Listening Post Collective just did a, a ecosystem um, um, analysis and their first the recommendation um, after this analysis was um, to start a fund. So we're already like starting conversations about that. And I'm, and I'm finding a, across the, the state, um, I haven't had a chance to really dig into um, Jane's um, report. I, I, I skimmed it before this call. Um, I haven't had a chance to really, I told her I'm looking at it over the, the weekend. Um, but you know, part of it is just um, finding out who's interested within the community foundation. Sometimes program officer, sometimes it's a conversation with the CEO. Um, most of the uh, uh, publishers that we find are kind of, you know, especially in the community media space, are community leaders too. So they have connections with um, other community leaders, and often they're all tied, you know, like, you know, the, with the community foundation. There's 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 a, a community role that community foundations normally play in their region. So across sectors, you know, there's so it's, e it's easy to start the conversation. I think it just depends too on where the community foundation is, what the resources they have are, and then their interests. But from what we're seeing in California, there's interest across the board from the smaller community foundation to the larger ones. Dave, I don't know if you, what, what you, what you think. Totally agree with all of that. Um, uh, Paulette said uh, community foundations are often conveners in the community, bringing together the nonprofit business and government sectors to work on, uh, issues uh, facing their regions or their service areas. And um, I don't know a single uh, CEO of a community foundation that would not be receptive to the publisher of the local newspaper coming in and uh, asking them for help and, and, and developing a partnership to work on this. So, um, you know, and that's, uh, you mentioned Paulette that uh, often publishers and, and editors are also community leaders that interface with uh, other sectors in their local economies. And that's certainly true with our publisher and our editor. We see them, you know, everywhere. Uh, service club meetings, um, they show up at, you know, um, public comment periods for at local government, so et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think I, I would just, I wouldn't be at all um, shy about um, having publishers approach community foundations. They're, they're, you know, one of the things that, one of the beautiful things about community foundations is that they're really seen as neutral, conveners uh, like Switzerland. And, uh, you know, many of, of them, their mission is simply to improve the quality of life for uh, people that uh, live and work and play in their service areas. So I, I think these kinds of discussions would be very, very welcome because I think most community foundation leaders would see uh, this project once they understand it as really essential to continue to build healthy, resilient, thriving communities. And I was wondering, David, if, um, if you could speak to, especially as a CEO, of even how it could be used to bring in donors that may not currently be donors to your um, community foundation. Because I think that's something that on the other side of it, we may not, as a publisher, you may not see how it brings value also to the community foundation. Sure, right. So, I mean, I don't know how many people participating in this call are, are that uh, familiar with community foundations, but they're public charities, so anybody can contribute. Uh, they uh, establish funds to support a specific cause or organization, and um, and then we pool all of the gifts we receive, invest them, and for the most part, uh, the assets are endowed, meaning we only grant out each year a small percentage of the overall market value of the portfolio. But you know, if you grow your portfolio, ours is approaching $100 million then you're generating grants and scholarship awards of about $4 million a year, last year, this year, next year. So uh, I totally agree with that. I think there are advantages to the community foundation to uh, having other offerings that are gonna motivate and inspire donors to uh, you know, contribute to the community foundation and continue to build its strength and its capacity to have impact in their regions. And, um, and I, I, as I said at the beginning, I think that we're sort of on this journey of discovery. So we have, we're sort of at the front end of a lot of the work that you're deeply involved in, Paulette. But my experience so far in talking to donors is 
they get excited about this and I think they're inspired by it. And I think once they understand, uh, you know, why we're asking the funding community to support a quote unquote for-profit enterprise, then uh, I think they're gonna be really receptive to supporting it. So I, I, there are advantages on the community foundation side uh, in terms of, uh, you know, connecting with new donors in addition to obviously having impact and supporting a, an essential uh, community institution. Do you, Dave, do you think you started out, this, the, the impetus started out with a relation with a particular newspaper. Uh, do you think that in the long run, it ends up, the fund ends up supporting others beside, in addition to that newspaper? Or uh, do you think it ends up, you know, staying focused on that one uh, institution? Well, um, you know, in part, I think it depends. Um, you know, my interest is actually broadening this uh, question of how uh, the funders community in our state can support local journalism and, and ensure that it's there for the long term. And uh, so, uh, you know, my intention is to work through our association, which is the Council of Michigan Foundations, which represent all of the private, corporate, and community foundations in our state, um, as well as my peers in the community foundation community, to have a conversation about this. Because there's, I think there, there's a uh, general lack of awareness uh, uh, about exactly what is happening to uh, local newsrooms, other than I think people uh, see that the quality of journalism is declining or their newspaper is closed. Uh, so I think there's I think there will be a lot of interest in thinking about this beyond just our local community and thinking about it regionally with other newspapers and maybe even statewide. And we have a, we're sort of in an interesting situation where we live because this is Northern Michigan, right? So far from uh, the major population centers like Grand Rapids and Detroit, but we also have a lot of talent that has relocated to Northern Michigan because for a variety of reasons, including remote working in light of the pandemic, um, and uh, you know, I would say also some climate refugees, uh, you know, trying to get away from the wildfires and the hurricanes and the floods. Uh, so we have an opportunity, I think, right here in uh, the Traverse City area to really uh, generate a lot of interest in this. But I, my, my longer term interest is to expand the conversation. Um, more broadly um, across, you know, across the funding community in Michigan. Okay. Thank you. Todd, any other questions come in? Actually, well, two great points from Frank uh, at LMA, who's always awesome to have on the calls, and also Joe Easton up from Bangor, Maine, essentially touching on what you just talked about, Dave, is all these years into it and Knight having its great media forum for about a decade or so. How do we get more community foundations talking to community foundations to say, get, it, get on this train? And what, what opportunities exist? And how can we try and leverage these conversations here to get, I mean, you're, you're essentially brand new, 18 months, 12 months to this conversation. How do we find the others in your field and get to them? Can I, can I, can I just jump in? Because I think Dave said something important. He talked about the, the state organization that his community foundation is a member of and we have a similar there's a, there's a national organization but there's each state has an organization that um, um, you know the major community foundations are part of so ours is a league of California community foundations and it has a 30 I think 33 members like all the largest community foundations um, and, and, a, and a few small ones are a part of that organization and the leader there, Laura Seaman, actually had a session that was an internal session for community foundation leadership. And as a board member, I was invited just to, to uh, attend that, where they featured, I think, four different community foundations and what they were doing. And they were kind of a, a, a diverse sampling of, of how they're doing this work. So, so one um, group in San Benito has um, the Benito Link that is like a kind of a new service that they that they created because there was a, a lack of of um, of news um, in 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 their specific community. Um, Long Beach has a collaborative where the where the community foundation went to the major media companies in Long Beach 
and said, you know, we had funding um, and I believe the funding may have come from Knight Foundation and brought them together to kind of tackle kind of big issues in their region. Um, and then you have those that are supporting specific um, organizations or institutions. But I think that, that one of the key is like, at least to get to community foundations, are these organizations um, like, like, like our League of you know, California Community Foundations um, to have the conversation and to convene their their members. Um, I don't know if you agree, Dave, but it sounds like that's what you're you know you're thinking about doing there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that that the community foundations that are partnering with uh, their newsrooms uh, can be uh, the door openers with their broader uh, community foundation community and. We have many opportunities. The CEOs of the community foundations in Michigan get together regularly. The Council of Michigan Foundations has an annual conference representing all of their membership. Um, in our part of the state from Mount Pleasant North, there are 13 community foundations, which, and we meet quarterly and people propose agenda items. So this would be easy for me to put on the agenda, invite um, Todd or, um, or Amy or, or Steve to come, uh, you know, at least virtually and speak to the group and explain kind of the whole concept. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think the funded community here is going to be real interested, but I think the community foundations can be sort of the conduit or the, uh, the, the door openers for uh, these broader conversations. And can I, and I, can I just add to like a, a kind of as a catalyst, I think um, one of the things that I'm, we're seeing in California, at least there's an interest at some of the major foundations I've talked to, is they're interested in how they could leverage the work that's being and the and the funding that's coming in um, uh, that could that's a that's an opportunity for funding regionally, how they can leverage their larger uh, dollars and investments um, and partner with the community foundation. So they're providing like a seed fund or a seed amount. And then the foundation could use that kind of seed amount to kind of galvanize local philanthropy. So, you know, we have half a million from this foundation to support community journalism. And then the community foundation can use that as leverage um, or at least conversation starter with, with kind of regional or local funders. Um, and so they're yeah, really so, that. yeah. I that's that's a great idea. So one of the challenges, right? And this is not unique to community foundations is capacity, right? So, and we're we're working on a a, uh, um, a, a cross sector uh, community development uh, strategy, uh, which is focused on a set of thirteen economic development, uh, societal and environmental goals. So think housing, access to quality childcare, community mobility, early childhood education and um, youth mental health, for example. And every one of those is a major issue that the community foundation is engaging in. So having some seed money to support, sort of provide some support for the backbone, I think is gonna be, it is always really critical. You know, anybody that's been involved in strategic planning knows it's a whole lot easier to put the strategy down on paper than it is to actually implement or execute it. And I think, um, so having some uh, support for the capacity side of this equation, I think, as you were alluding to, I think, Paula, is really, really important. Uh, Todd, do, I had a question I was gonna ask, but I don't wanna do that if there are other questions. Uh, no more questions, but uh, but but Tracy Bain of the Chicago Reader just posted a great um, step that's going on up there, a pursuit to get the uh, uh, 85 media outlets to sign on to uh, let's pool our funds into a single effort at the Chicago Community Trust. And it's oh, wow. Up, yeah, uh, so that's very on. That's very on. It's in the Google Doc. It's in chat. But if you've not had a chance to bump into Tracy's comment, it's pretty exciting. Well, and that kind of goes to actually what I was going to ask about, which is that if you think about the evolution of the early days of community foundation support for journalism, a lot of it was fairly specific. Uh, it, you know, one community foundation helping one newspaper or one public radio station that they had a relationship with, and, and that was great. 
And I think it seems like part of what we're seeing now and part of what in a way is the defining characteristic of what we're calling the community news fund as a group is it is it's broader. It's broader in terms of the community, the, the funding. It's not just a single, you know, community foundation that's attempting to engage other stakeholders on the donor side, which can mean other community foundations, but in some cases also donors in general. And it's also broader on the who we're helping side in that it's looking a little more at the ecosystem as a whole, um, ecosystem in the community. Um, and as, as Paula was saying, you know, in some cases, ecosystem in the state or the region, which seems important because obviously one of the flaws of having, you know, local community funds driven by community foundations as a really key part of the solution which I think it is and hope it will be, is that not every community has a community foundation. There are many, you know, you don't want a situation where the kind of the rich get richer or the, the areas that have already have strong philanthropic, you know, efforts just get stronger and the areas where it's weaker just get, get left behind. So, you know, probably the only way to solve something like that is with more collaborative regional or state, you know, efforts. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the one thing I kind of wonder about, two things that that sort of implies to me, that kind of a model is first, when you think about the going out to a wider range of funders, um, that's, a you know, in some cases, a new experience for, uh, for these institutions. And it requires almost a kind of public education function of this of the community foundation or whatever the entity is that's sort of you know catalyzing this um, with the community as it's sort of educating them. It's not pat. It's not a passive reactive role. It's actually kind of proactive in explaining you know why is why are we doing this? Why is there this community uh, news fund? Why is it important? Um, I mean, do, do you agree with that? And is that, you know, new, a, a new, a new function? Are there any, any kind of pitfalls that we should be thinking about uh, as, as institutions start to do that more? There's, I, I wrote education when you were talking before you said it. There's a, there is an education process. And I think there's also, I've been talking to my CEO, Michelle Decker, about, uh, about this idea. Um, like I said, she's, um, She's upset with me that I'm talking about community foundations, media funding, and we don't have a fund. Although I, I wouldn't say that I do have a field of interest fund for some of my mapping work. So California Community Foundation has funded uh, some of our, one of our initiatives, the newspapers initiatives through our fund at the community foundation. But this idea of this kind of general fund, um, you know, we've been talking about like equity in our conversations around equity and diversity. And I think that's tied in with this education, even around media, um, because you have folks who are really, I'm just thinking some of the civic leaders who have come to me and said, you know, our newspaper isn't what it used to be. We need to do something. And they don't understand what the nature of news looks like now and what it may be looking like in the future. They don't also understand the diversity of the news ecosystem and the um, institutions like mine that have been around for 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 uh, decades that are doing work in all parts of um, we have a huge two county region, and so for us, you know, Michelle's like Paulette, you know, this conversation also has to be tied in with the conversation around equity, around diversity, um, you know, and something that we've already as a community foundation been focused on, but even in this conversation around media, she's like, we we definitely have to 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 have um, to that that kind of framing of this conversation with current donors. And then as we look beyond our current donors, um, um, making sure that we have a, a kind of a diverse frame where we're looking at, which is what we're doing with all of our uh, development initiatives and efforts. Um, but yeah, that's cl clearly education um, of donors. And I think of community um, is really important and, and equity is an important component of that. All right, I think uh, I see some more questions. Yeah, for just, um, 
actually out from Paul's end of the world in California, Maya, Maya jumps in with on the same note, what components of education data do we need to start telling the story? List of local and ethnic media in each state, who is in each news ecosystem, every state is different. What other foundational information or data do we need to get started? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, you know, basics of, of, of knowing who's serving what communities. Um, and that's one of the projects that we worked on for the California, um, with the California Community Foundation was just because they're in LA County, their name is California Community Foundation, but their focus is LA County. And they were, you know, that was part of the kind of foundational work with because there were hundreds, actually, I didn't even realize they were, and I think we ended up with um, uh, about almost 300 um, outlets that have, were working in LA County. Um, and then what communities that they're representing and servicing um, and serving. And, you know, we have to do the same, we have to do the same thing here in um, the Inland Empire, which is where I'm from. And we've been talking about media and color doing that across the state. We're actually talking to some funders about, you know, kind of trying to do that work across the state. Um, and then looking at not just who's being served, but who's not being served. Um, and then where are there, where are those opportunities for investment through things like these community news funds or some of the larger funders who may be interested in um, some of the, the places that don't, that are the, the, that are the um, places that have those information gaps, how they can help kind of invest in, in um, some new, like our creators, some of the, some of the, some, some new journalists or helping some that are already there expand. Yeah, in the uh, parlance of development and fundraising, um, in addition, just some uh, basic facts uh, that need to be researched about some of the things Paulette was talking about, you know, really coming up with a case for support, which is something that creates a sense of um, urgency that explains uh, the situation in terms that people can understand that inspire and enlighten people. And I think, um, you know, that can be done, uh, you know, with one foundation and one newspaper. It can be done regionally, statewide. It can be done nationally. And I think uh, thinking about a really coherent, persuasive, clear um, case for support, um, I think would be, uh, you know, really, really useful. And I know RFA, part of, part of the interactions we've had, Steve, with you and with, with Amy and with Todd has been, what is working, what's not working? What kind of questions are you receiving from donors as you, you know, go on this, travel this road? And, you know, answering questions like, well, how sustainable um, is this? And, um, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, under, understanding the business side of the newspaper business. So I think there's, there is some uh, legwork that needs to happen to grow uh, this, it, it's relatively early stage into something that um, uh, really starts to pick up steam. And, you know, you'd ask a little while ago about the ecosystem. I think it has to be both uh, at the local level and show some uh, small wins and progress, which then builds momentum. And, you know, in the funding community, they like to see success, right? Donors like to see it. Other funders like to see it. Uh, the community likes to see it. And so I think one thing is uh, managing our own expectations about how quickly this can go and then um, continue to kind of grow it and uh, uh, sort of uh, stair step it until we really grow this into a uh, kind of a powerful movement. And uh, I'm, I'm actually remain optimistic just because of the nature of this work that uh, we're really going to be on to engage the community, but you have to have uh, the right tools and they have to be really effective and you have to have the answers at your fingertips. And when you have that, you know, it increases efficiency and the effectiveness of, of the work that you're doing. So we are unfortunately out of time, but please, this has been great. Thank you so much, uh, Dave and Paulette. Um, Please uh, put anyone who's interested in this topic of community news funds or the other things we've talked about today, do please put your name and contact information in the Google Doc um, or contact uh, in addition to Dave or Paulette, Todd Franco or 
uh, Amy Bong at Report for America and look for the report that Amy's been uh, leading coming out soon. And uh, uh, to highlight this really interesting, I think important development. Um, and why don't we, we'll wrap up there and thank you very much everyone for, for attending this session. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for all, all the Report for America is doing. Um, it, it makes it easier for us to have that conversation locally um, about getting getting support. Oh. It makes sense when we say you're supporting a journalist in the newsroom. Thank you. You, know, get it, so yeah, thank you guys you. have been a fantastic catalyst for this work, so thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to work with you guys. Really appreciate and it. And thank you to all three of our speakers. It was so exciting to hear your conversation and to see everybody's input in the chat. It's really great to see that everyone is connecting and I really hope that everyone enjoyed this session. Just as a reminder, the next block of sessions begins in a half hour at 2 p.m. and then our final session, I believe, begins at 4.30. So make sure you don't miss out. And thank you once again to everyone for attending and to our amazing speakers for a great presentation. Bye everyone. Thank you.